permaculture is a design system. It's not a technique or a set of techniques. When I'm teaching it, I tell people I'm not here to teach you how to do things. I'm here to teach you how to think about doing things. It's how to select the appropriate response for any given condition. Today, let's introduce the concept of zones, which is one of the central design tools of permaculture. Um, I like to simplify it for most people because uh, even permaculturists quite often tend to make things too complex. And, uh, and really it's not useful if we don't know what we're talking about. Uh, zones in traditional permaculture have been presented uh, using a model of basically concentric circles, like a bullseye, a target. And uh, right away I think there's a problem with that. <clears throat> Uh, because things don't happen in perfect concentric circles ever, ever, anywhere. Um, we move around too much. <clears throat> and then there's been a lot of disagreement about uh, what the different zones mean in terms of use. Um, as a design tool, though, it still has its brilliant conceptual uh, basis. <clears throat> I simply like to explain it in terms of time and space and how frequently do we need to visit certain areas. <clears throat> you want to keep those closest to you. I don't know how many people I know through the years who have the first nice, warm, wonderful days of spring, they've decided they're going to make this enormous garden with all kinds of great intentions, and they put it way out in the back of their property, where you have to get up and go out there. It becomes a chore. <clears throat> and trust me, around here, by the middle of June, all those good ideas and intentions from last March become work, and the garden doesn't get visited. So as much as possible, bring it close to the nest right here. If you need something from that you're cooking with every day, <clears throat> like your herb garden, and you can plant that right outside your kitchen door, that's where it should go. If it needs to be visited every day or frequently, or if you need to visit it, think about the needs of what's going on out there. Each plant or each chicken, chickens you have to take care of. So you have to go visit. <clears throat> so they should be in a relatively close zone. Forget about the numbers. That's kind of silly and irrelevant. That's, that's for linear thinkers. But nature is not linear. So you're going to be moving around. <clears throat> so right here, I set this up very intentionally a little bit away from the house because this was going to be and served as a market garden. It was, <clears throat> think of it as a garden farm. So it, it, I grew things very intensively for the market, but confined them largely to this space, which is equivalent to a good-sized backyard. You could set this up and we could pretend 
that this is the house and you're stepping right outside the back door. It's actually the garage and the carport. But never mind. That's okay. <laughs> so um, this is where I do most of the intensive work. Zone one, that is these inner zones, is almost never truly in and of itself sustainable. <clears throat> it's where we baby things. I like a lot of basil. We grow our peppers. Those annual crops, primarily annual crops, <laughs> that uh, require a certain amount of extra care, water, compost, nurture. Things that can reseed themselves, I let grow freely, and anything that needs to be thinned becomes salad grains. Um, that way I don't have to do the work. Small domesticated animals, chickens, uh, rabbits, if you like them, <clears throat> little fruit trees that need to be pruned and espaliered, uh, dwarf type things. Um, all of those things go in your inner selves. Then as you move out, it doesn't need you to go out there nearly as often. Uh, <clears throat> it doesn't need to be irrigated as often doesn't need to be visited. So the outer zones would be where you have large market gardens or where you have orchards. And then further out from that would be pasture, wood forestry projects, things like that, that you're still taking care of. And doing a certain amount of work, but you're only going there seasonally. Like even in a large orchard, you're only harvesting primarily in a certain window of time, and then you need to do constant pruning and maintenance and upkeep, but that can be usually spread out. And then finally, the outermost zone is wilderness. That's zone five. And that's where everything, you might be dinner if you go out there. You know. So often, Zone 5 is presented as this outer band. It's somewhere out there. That's where <clears throat> we're not controlling it. But if you stop to think about it, we're swimming in a Zone 5 matrix. Anytime you neglect something, just look under your couch or in a, in a closet you haven't opened the door or <clears throat> remove a manhole cover or any branch in the tree you can't reach, that becomes zone five. So it, it's about how much <clears throat> do we have to control and want to control, and how well are we able to control it. So true sustainability comes when we recognize that we can't control very much. We can maintain certain things if they're very well designed to minimize the amount of work and the amount of waste that are going into that and harvest all of the free inputs. So we're reducing our footprint and as much as we can meet our needs in a very small confined area, that's smart thinking. <clears throat> now you're on the way to sustainability, which is the real goal of permaculture. Okay, so
it's all a gift. Yeah. So, because we have so many horses, uh, um, sequestered in that paddock, there, um, initially when I was negotiating for space, <laughs> loving negotiations with my wife, <laughs> um, this was all the space that I had available these little margins to plant my fruit tree collection and here the crop is not the fruit itself but the scion wood, the cutting because each one of these trees is a different variety from fruit repositories around the world uh, <clears throat> so we have several hundred different varieties. Each one is a different variety. Some of them go back a thousand years or more. Uh, so there's a lot of kind of special DNA in this collection. But I had to set it up in a very condensed space. So what I did was to simply cut a parallel swale um, to the irrigation channel right here. So we run water down it and then open the gates and fill the swale. And it's planted very close together on six foot centers here. Um, but what I have developed here is a system that only needs to be irrigated once or maybe twice a year um, for about 45 minutes which is less water than most people are going to use to water their basil and tomatoes in a season but i have several hundred varieties of trees so this is my zone four if you want to think of it that way it's one of the outer zones um, and I have a, a lot of extra fruit every year and quite a few raccoons and skunks come in here too. But the idea is I can then take cuttings from each one of these trees and propagate them and give them to people because we're testing to see how hardy they are, how well they produce in our extremes. So that's the thinking behind all of this intensive design, you know. It is for production, but not for marketing. So what we're trying to do is to enable people to have fruit everywhere. So what I really want to do is to start uh, crossing some of these established old varieties and getting seed to create new varieties. And so by my calculations, I'll have to live to be about 350 uh, to begin to see some of the results from that. So <laughs> I hope we have a lot of fruit. It keeps me healthy. <laughs> the important design tools then is, and this one's a, a bit simpler to understand, it's called sector analysis. <clears throat> and it's talking about from any, any location, where are the various things, elements, <clears throat> things that might impact and influence the garden? Where do they come from? 
So primarily we're talking about weather systems and prevailing weather systems. You know? So in the winter, this is north. I mean, all year round this is north, but in the winter we uh, get our dominant systems coming in from the north west usually uh, the large storm systems but occasionally we'll get east canyon winds <laughs> and so you have to figure out where they're coming from where are the prevailing winds coming from in spring <clears throat> late winter and early spring we often get really monstrous winds coming from this area over here um, you also want to think about migration patterns, both large ones and smaller ones. Where are wild animals, birds, insects? Insects migrate. So, you know, they'll be coming down through the Bosque system, which is right over here. But they know about this, these locations that are well irrigated and have food, so they'll show up here and kind of put this on their radar. So you need to anticipate those things coming in. <clears throat> Understand where the sun flows. I set this up intentionally on an axis to follow the sun's course. So at any time during the year, I know exactly where the sun's gonna be. Um, <clears throat> unless the, the earth shifts on its axis, I can count on the summer solstice coming up pretty much over that corner and coming high overhead. In winter, it'll come from over here and set over here. So we're in mid-autumn right now, pretty much at the midpoint. equinox and solstice. So, um, during those colder winter months, then I want to harvest the sunlight. So this area over here becomes kind of a catchment like that. And likewise, I planted a lot of trees where that was an open field and I planted the bamboo in order to protect against those winds, those cooling winds, and <clears throat> to offer quite a bit of shade then in the summer to keep it from getting too hot. So I created these hedgerows here and in the front part uh, to protect against those scouring winds that come in late winter and early spring. And it works very well. I've compared temperature readings um, in the 20 years or so that we've been here. And we used to have not only below zero, but down into the teens below zero, 12, 15, 17 degrees below zero out here when we first moved in. And lately we haven't been below zero at all. Part of that's due to climate change, but a lot of it is simply due to the protection of the larger trees and kind of harvesting that warmth. So, um, and then you also need to factor in things like noise, pollution, you know, that's the road. Our neighbors like to ride motorcycles and big trucks. Uh, so there's a lot of pollution coming in from that direction. <clears throat> I want to keep that out of here. I like to keep it private. I don't want a lot of people just kind of gawking when I'm out here working. This is my sanctuary, you know. Um, so factor in all of those things. People walk up and down the 
Asakya, right here there's a path. <clears throat> Generally those people are friendly, so I like to encourage that and have them look in and, and see what's going on and we talk and chat. Um, so each of those things is part of understanding sectors, you know, things that will have an impact. Where is the dust coming from? Where is the, the uh, smells coming from? <laughs> you know, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever <clears throat> might be an impact. You know, if your neighbor is a heavy smoker, you might want to consider that. That's a factor in your enjoyment of your garden, your mm -hmm. backyard. some of the old systems of planting on such and such a date are really out the window right now. They don't apply anymore. Um, even the types of things that we grow and when we plant them are no longer applicable with any certainty. That's nature reminding us don't mess with me, <laughs> you know. Um, and almost all of this could be directly seen as a result of climate chaos, as I prefer to call it, um, <clears throat> because we've been altering the whole climate systems, weather systems, uh, weather patterns. And a lot of that has to do with our burning of fossil fuels, among other things. <clears throat> but that's a direct source and a direct problem. And a lot of that has to do with our agricultural systems. <clears throat> As we have industrialized them, uh, basically what we've done is to perpetuate extraordinarily immature systems that can't grow up. <clears throat> so we don't grow up. Our attitudes don't grow up. We don't, we don't learn to mature and become flexible. Um, so part of the, the approach of permaculture <clears throat> is focus on the permanent part. It's how can we perpetuate? How can we perennialize our attitudes? <clears throat> Two weeks ago, a week ago, actually, we, we had record heat <clears throat> and everything here was flourishing. It's, I forget how many days above 80 we had had, but we were approaching a record for October. Um, <clears throat> and we had all these beautiful late crops everything and but it had been extraordinarily dry too <clears throat> so that was a trade-off um, but people were still bringing in all of their summer vegetables I had a, a crop of basil that had regrown after I had cut all of it <clears throat> uh, for a late summer harvest so I ran out here in anticipation of the storm, harvested all the beans and everything, and then we got wiped out. Uh, we got about six inches of snow and it got very cold. And you could look upon that with despair and grief and say, oh no, it's, it's all gone. <laughs> you know. Or you could simply look upon it as a gift. Um, yeah, it was a bit of a harsh transition. That's okay. That's going to happen. <clears throat> Get used to it. My suggestion is lower your center of gravity and kind of go with the flow. It's okay. <laughs> Just roll with it. <clears throat> what I did immediately once it melted off and I could come out here and work was to begin cutting things back. <clears throat> 
looking upon it as free water. In fact, I rolled up big snowballs and put them in each of my circles, big piles, so for all that extra water. Um, and then began chopping everything up and using it as mulch right there where it was. Um, and it's free space to plant more things now. Right? So we have to, to simply see the gifts in everything. Do you live in a loving universe or in a hostile universe? A loving universe sees all of this as a gift. And so it's free stuff. Say thank you and get back to work. doesn't get pruned anymore. <laughs> 